been through in, in the last year and, and beyond. And so whatever you're going through today, I just pray that God uses Michael's message today to and his music to, to strengthen and uh, strengthen you and make your journey just a little easier. So again, welcome. And I, it's my privilege to introduce Mr. Ben Alloway. Good afternoon. Welcome to this first ever Zoom concert at Emmanuel. Whether you're joining us in person or online, this is also the first concert put on by a new organization we have at Emmanuel called the Van Auken Friends of Music, which is going to support all kinds of musical aspects of our program here at the church. We're also very grateful to our co-sponsors, Bethany Lutheran Church in Thompson, uh, FCIS Insurance here in Forest City, and HappyHolidayopolis.com, which is a fantastic new platform for online concerts. And so they're bringing us all together from the Old Wick, Old Wick Black Box Theater in Happy Holidayopolis. My friend Roosevelt, who you've met before, some of you, if you've seen worship uh, services online or, or here, um, Roosevelt and I met Michael down in Nashville in 2019 out on an old farm. Uh, our, our guests, our, our hosts had uh, invited him out to play with us and uh, his banjo and brilliant voice filled this old 1804 farmhouse. We were spellbound. It's been a dream of mine to share him with you and we are thrilled that this is happening today. Michael describes his music as part country with a touch of R&B, gospel and a little bit of bluegrass. Uh, he was featured on promotions for Ken Burns' country music documentary on PBS, and through a connection with Darius Rucker's uh, people, uh, began a relationship with Jonas Entertainment, and he is now uh, working on recording a five-song EP with a producer who's got a number of uh, number one hits to his credit. So uh, you're seeing someone who's going places today, and I hope that... Uh, you are gonna be as blessed as, as I know that I will be. And so without any further ado, let's give Michael Ricks a hometown welcome from Forest City. Uh, bring it on, Michael. Well, how is everyone? I hope everyone can hear everything well. And, uh, Pardon my little bit of a challenge here. I've got to turn on my kick drum. <clears throat> well, God bless you guys, and thank you, Ben. Thank you, Emmanuel uh, Church. And I know there's one other church that's joined us, and their name has slipped my mind. Uh, and I know there's an insurance company that um, also is uh, helping this to all happen. And holiday, happy holiday, Opolis, and uh, everyone that's on the team there. Uh, Rue and Beth, uh, thank you all so much for helping make all of this happen. And uh, I'm going to play some music, otherwise I'm going to be talking too much. <laughs> so, uh, as Ben mentioned, we met uh, at a friend's house. Uh, his name is Robbie Grayson, and he helped me publish my book and helped me tell my story, and I got to sing and do some music for you. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is um, let's start with something that everyone would know and uh, can worship to and sing to bless the lord on oh my soul Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship. 
worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I think you guys will know this next one too. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great Thou art! How great Thou Thank you guys. Thank you for the love and kindness there. Uh, I appreciate you guys being here today. There's not only people watching from the Zoom on Holiday Opulus, uh, there are people watching on Facebook Live. And just to check in on Facebook, I'm going to make sure that that is broadcasting well. Uh, and you should be able to also watch it on uh, the Facebook a page of Holiday Opolis as well. So it looks like it's uh, showing up well. So if you see me, check the social media pages from time to time. I just want to make sure everything's uh, technically flowing okay. And uh, I see Quincy, I see Mark, I see Carolyn, I see Kelly, I see Krista and Marla, uh, Peggy, um, and the great folks I can see in the pews at, Hol at uh, Emmanuel Lutheran. Um, so I want to say Blessings to you all. I can see you uh, waving to me there. And uh, <clears throat> um, and so uh, <laughs> just checking some things technically there. All right. So uh, I want to thank Ben uh, for bringing me on today and, and let me share my testimony and story. Uh, I'm going to do a few more songs here before I get into that, but uh, Robbie Grayson was kind enough to introduce me to Ben and Rue, and that's why you're seeing me today. Um, uh, my story is a redemption story. It's a recovery story. Um, so everything that I'm going to share with you is about God's redemption, God's grace, God's ability to turn something that would normally be a dark, uh, horrible uh, ending, and uh, you know maybe as people would expect, 
uh, for things in my life because of my journey to have gone very badly. Uh, but as a result of God's help and God's mercy, uh, that didn't happen. And so when you hear my story, you're going to hear some very uh, challenging, tragic uh, stories. But as you follow me through that journey, you're going to hear uh, and see redemption uh, take over in that moment. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? And all will see how great, how great is our God. Is our God and 
all will see how great, how great is our God. Well, uh, my story is a one of uh, tragedy uh, to redemption. Um, when I came to Nashville, um, I was in the process of starting over. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you that story and talk to you about what my life was like before coming to Nashville and kind of the way I believe that God began to turn my life around and um, give me the testimony and story that I'm going to tell you today. Um, when I first came to Nashville, uh, something very unique happened. I visited a friend um, in 2009. Um, in, in coming to Nashville, at that time I was living in Ohio. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Ohio uh, had just had a horrible renter, winter the bottom end of 2008. Um, I had been downsized out of my job in uh, Ohio uh, at this car dealership that I was working at. Uh, I had been recently married and went through a journey with that as well, which I will tell you. Uh, and in the process of losing that job, the economy crashing, uh, I get a phone call from a friend of mine and he says, hey, uh, come visit me. Uh, I'm doing a, throwing a party here in Nashville. I got signed with a major label and uh, I'm kind of having a party celebration. And I told him, hey man, I'm, I'm kind of going through some, some, some deep waters and uh, I would, probably, you know, should choose to, to come visit you here in Nashville another time. And he wouldn't take no for an answer. And his name was Leroy. And uh, he kept pestering me on the phone and, and finally says, oh, okay, okay, I'll cut my shifts covered. Because at that time, I had finally gotten uh, two part-time jobs, one at Applebee's and one at Panera. And I was working from five in the morning till three in the afternoon at Panera Bread and then working from four to midnight at Applebee's seven days a week uh, after losing my job in 2007. Uh, I was desperately trying to earn an income. And this is probably October, November of 2008 when I finally get some kind of employment. That's how bad the economy was um, where I was at. And so I come to Nashville, visit my friend here in Franklin, Tennessee, which is about 25 minutes south of Nashville. We have a lunch. Uh, we eat lunch. We get back in my car. He gets in the passenger side. I get in the driver's side. I sit down. And behind the wheel, I, you know, I'm sitting there kind of slouched in the seat. And so I'm scooting back into the seat and I put my foot on the brake to kind of brace myself. And when I do, I hear <laughs> and the pedal goes all the way to the floor. And I thought, OK, that's not good. So long story short, when that happened, uh, I thought either the master cylinder blew or something had happened uh, even worse. And I said, I looked at my buddy Leroy and I says, I think the brake lines have blown. And he just started laughing hysterically. And he's like, dude, you're supposed to be here. He, he has this phrase. He's like, this is your kingdom. This is where you're supposed to be. This is your kingdom. I'm telling you, dude, it's a sign. It's a sign. I'm like, no, it's terrible. This is awful news. I open the, front, the driver's side door and I see a, an inch wide trickle of, of uh, uh, brake fluid running out onto the parking lot. So I said, okay, we've blown the brake lines. And uh, three holes blew in my brake lines that day. And uh, long story short, it was a massive repair bill, like over $1,000. Long story short, that stuck me in Nashville and it spawns, uh, spawned the uh, this song that I'm gonna play for you called Best Foot Forward. My friend Kristen, uh, who's one of my uh, fellow country artists and friends here in Nashville, she said, well, when we were writing this song, she says, you put your best foot forward. So... I put my best foot forward Though I fell short my share of times But I'ma rise above and Break the ties that bind And leave the past behind
I put my best foot forward And though I fell short My share of times But I'ma rise above it And break the ties that bind And leave the past behind I'm gonna cash in on it turning around There is no going back Cause there's nothing there for me I'm gonna start again And put our roots in the ground I put my best I'm a lone survivor, though I'm not alone. There's stories like mine, and they bring us together from worlds apart. And it's time we drop our guard. Oh, I'm gonna take a chance, and if it all goes south. I'm gonna cash in on it turning around. There is no going back, cause there's nothing there for me. I'm gonna start again, put our roots in the ground. I put my best foot forward. Mm. I put my best foot. I'm gonna take a chance If it all goes south Gonna cash in On it turning around There is no going back Cause there's nothing there for me I'm gonna start again I Put our roots in the ground I put my best foot forward Oh So that's the song I wrote kind of as a tribute to that journey. Uh, I want to thank Tasha, Kelly, Carolyn, Mark, uh, Quincy, Peggy, Krista, and Marla for all joining us and everyone else is uh, joining us on Facebook Live as well. Uh, I'm going to dive right into my story. Um, awesome, awesome. So we're also up on the Holidayopolis page as well on the Facebook page. And if you haven't already stopped over, please stop over and, and give them a thumbs up on the page. And I want to just say thank you again for the opportunity to tell my story. Um, I mentioned being in Ohio, and Ohio uh, was where I moved from before uh, moving here to Nashville. My story uh, kind of starts in two different places, part in Lima, Ohio, and uh, part in what is known as... Um, uh, Noble County, Indiana, and I'm sending, I'm sending a message to Robbie Grayson to tell him he can join us if he would so choose um, by Facebook since he was so uh, gracious to get the three, of, the three of us together in the first place, and I thought we shouldn't celebrate and party without him, so, uh, and we, we know we party in Jesus style, just so you know, <laughs> so, all right, that's done. So my story starts. My story starts um, with my dad and mother being in Lima, Ohio. Uh, they meet as college sweethearts uh, in Lima, Ohio. Uh, my dad was born in '51. My mother was born in '52. Uh, my dad was born in Mobile, Alabama, and my uh, mother was born in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, they both ended up in Lima, Ohio. Uh, after, during kind of the World War II as bo baby boomers and my dad's parents came up from Mobile, Alabama to Lima and my mother's parents uh, from Louisville, Kentucky and my parents grew up going to 4th Street Baptist Church together. I was born uh, in 76 and my uh, 
uh, mom and dad were in college uh, together. My mom and dad met in, uh, prior to that in high school, and my dad asked my mother to prom, and then that began their dating relationship their senior year, and my mother decided to go to Bowling Green State University. My dad, being in love with my mother, decided to follow her to Bowling Green State University, and he started his medical uh, degree and uh, started to study for uh, to be a heart surgeon and family practitioner, and my mother went for psychology. So uh, after they'd been married about two years, um, about four years, I was born, and at this time, my parents have uh, been going to a small chapel on the campus of Bowling Green State University, and they have been, uh, you know, following these teachings uh, through some friends uh, that had introduced them to Christ, and they came to the knowledge of Jesus and uh, confessed salvation and became believers, but they began to listen to these sermons with this particular gentleman named Hobart Freeman, and uh, they would get these cassette tapes, uh, which they would uh, get on a monthly or weekly basis uh, as they were on a paid subscription listening to this gentleman's sermons. And uh, Hobart Freeman was based in, no in uh, Noble County, uh, Wilmot, uh, Kosciuszko County. Those two counties are side by side in Indiana. And he has a church there at this time that's grown to about 2,000 members. And my parents are getting the cassette tapes uh, on a monthly, weekly basis and following his teachings. So Hobart Freeman was part of the uh, Kenneth Hagen uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, Jimmy Swagger, uh, the whole kind of televangelist era that was big, uh, Tammy and Jim Baker, uh, that whole era, if you're familiar with them, um, they had a big influence on TV in the 80s. Long story short, Hobart Freeman was far more conservative and didn't believe in television, and so he opted to be on FM radio and AM radio, and he had a worldwide distribution of books and cassettes and also satellite churches uh, that went even into Russia and parts of Africa and other parts of Europe and also multiple satellite churches here in the States. Um, so long story short, my parents are listening to these cassette tapes. My mother has finished college and my dad is still uh, finishing up his residency. And one particular day after they've been, you know, consistently listening to these teachings, um, Hobart Freeman uh, had an assistant pastor and my dad got one of those cassette tapes. And this one particular statement on the cassette tape was, uh, God has a ways and means committee by which he will get to you. And my dad heard that statement, um, and this particular sermon was about Jonah and how he was running from God. And so during the course of this sermon, my dad began to make a certain number of decisions. Now, Hobart Freeman also didn't believe in medical treatment uh, in a very similar fashion to some Scientology teachings or Jehovah's Witness teachings. And so my father decided to, when he heard that statement, to, that that was his signal from God to abandon his medical career. And at that point, he um, left his residency, uh, did not continue uh, to graduate or finish uh, being in his profession. And my mother also uh, began to back away from her career. By the time I'm four years old, uh, we've gone back to Lima, Ohio, uh, as my parents have left the Toledo, Ohio, Bowling Green State University area, and they go back to Lima, Ohio, where they were raised. And for that little bit of period of time, there was just kind of this law. My dad works a bunch of random odd jobs, and my mother is home, uh, homeschooling us, uh, myself, and three other brothers and sisters by this point. And uh, we are there for another five, four years, and then by the time I'm eight years old, uh, we get on a Greyhound bus, and my dad can, decides to tell my mother to sell everything. Uh, I kind of flipped that backwards there. My dad gets my mother to, in, and they both agree to sell everything. And my dad has been continuing to follow these teachings and we get on a Greyhound bus and we drive to uh, the church in Indiana called Faith Assembly and we join the cult uh, of 2,000 member uh, there in Indiana. That first night that we got there was a Wednesday night. I remember we, myself and my three brothers and sisters 
and my mother, dad, and mother and father, we had these two orange suitcases. We get off the bus, and I remember us just standing there, and the bus driving off, and we're just kind of standing there, and I believe it was either North Webster or Warsaw, Indiana, uh, at, the, uh, at the Greyhound bus stop there. And I just remember kind of, you know, just, it was kind of like one of those moments you realize, okay, that just happened. Um, that began our first night of going to this church with Hobart Freeman. Now, Hobart Freeman, uh, basically the, 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 way, the way I was raised and the way these teachings were, in order to get God to love you, you had to follow these rules. Um, so, you know, there was no watching TV, there was no birthdays, uh, there was no anniversary celebrations, uh, there was no holiday celebrations, um, women had to wear uh, uh, dresses uh, or no makeup, um, you weren't allowed to listen to secular music uh, and or non-Christian music for, for those who are no, not familiar with that phrase. And even Christian rock like bands like Petra uh, or Whiteheart uh, were considered evil. Uh, and so I began to go into this new life um, in Indiana and as my father got more entrenched in these teachings uh, there began to be distance between myself and my family and our extended family grandparents etc and by the time we had been there for a significant time there was virtually no contact uh, allowed with my uh, extended family so as that continued um, Hobart Freeman, uh, the church is continuing to grow extensively. Uh, they're drawing a lot of uh, media, local media, and some outside media attention. Uh, and through some unfortunate circumstances and some advice that he gave to some people, he ends up in some very large multi-million dollar uh, lawsuits. And uh, there was a death of a teenager and some divorces that resulted uh, from some of the things that they uh, were advised to do by Hobart Freeman, and the church began to be embroiled in a crazy paparazzi-like uh, uh, disaster uh, that engulfed the church and engulfed Hobart Freeman, uh, and basically overshadowed the church and kind of gave the church this martyrdom kind of, oh my God, we're fighting in trying to serve God so strong, the world is coming after us because we're so holy and so righteous. And so there was this this you know, kind of a constant uh, message of we're the only ones, we're the ones striving for God. If it wasn't for them, for God, they wouldn't come after us. And there was this kind of that constant atmosphere in the air uh, of, you know, look how holy we are. They're coming after us. They're trying to kill us, you know, kind of a, kind of approach to the way that they were handling things. Sadly, Hobart Freeman gets, uh, steps on a nail and gets gangrenous. Uh, and of course, he, you know, knowing that he would be uh, graded against his teachings uh, of no medical treatment, um, he began to refuse treatment, uh, and he began to be uh, prosecuted in Warsaw, Indiana, and about the time of his arraignment, within like a week or less, uh, he becomes gangrenous and passes away, uh, leaving the church flailing, uh, while at the same time escaping the, uh, the wrath of the local prosecutors and uh, the controversy that was, you know, about to be left on the church as a result of his absence. Um, I'll never forget being like about 10 years old, uh, sitting in the church the Sunday that they announced his death. And they said, uh, they said, I just remember the worship pastor being on stage and he said, it's needful. And I was like, what? I remember just being shocked at him saying that. And he said it again, it's needful. As if him exiting and passing away was obviously something that uh, needed to happen because or some way uh, the church would not continue to uh, survive under such negative circumstances. Uh, by the time I'm 11 years old, I start having asthma uh, significant asthma uh, complications and uh, of course because my parents are following these teachings primarily my father uh, who's driving the bus of this whole situation um, I did, was refused treatment uh, 
And just to let you know that I'm not uh, fibbing, <laughs> that's my inhaler uh, for asthma. Um, <clears throat> and I began to have three-day asthma attacks. And these asthma episodes uh, would get very, very severe. And because of the hay fever and because of being out in the country where we lived, um, the symptoms were very, very intense. And I would sit there for three days on the sofa in front of a fan trying to breathe. Uh, a few years go by, about three years. By the time I'm 14, um, our family is now seven children. Uh, one of the tenets of these teachings uh, was there was no birth control uh, um, as far as pregnancy was concerned, and people uh, looked at that as a sin, and so the families were very large in this church community. So my family was no different. Uh, we had seven kids by that point. I have a younger brother who is born, and by the time I'm 14 years old, he's about six months of age, and uh, he contracts meningitis, uh, and over the course of a week, I ended up noticing that uh, my mother's requests were getting ignored by my father for this particular incident. Um, she was asking him to get treat for him to get treatment, and my father again refused. Um, <clears throat> saying that God would be displeased with us uh, if we did this. So uh, after over a week, I ended up noticing and watching him decline, and I ended up uh, uh, in the living room on a Saturday morning, uh, standing there as my brother is passing away, and my dad's profusely praying and begging God and saying scripture texts and just like kind of in this prayer process, hoping that God will um, rescue him and give him a divine miracle. The, pro the premise of this whole no medication thing was that you would only pray uh, for healing. Um, if you did seek any kind of other methods like homeopathic or natural remedies, you did it in private and you snuck and did it. You didn't uh, know, let anyone know you did it. I mean, it was a very common occurrence to see people pulling in the parking lot, taking off their prescription eyeglasses, uh, it was very common to see people, you know, try stopping their medication for heart disease and different things of that nature. Um, and as a result, up to that point when my brother had died, a significant number of children had passed away. Uh, parents were beginning to go away uh, in prison for one to two years um, at that time. And then by the time my uh, brother is has passed, uh, People are starting to go away for 10 years, uh, both parents. So this situation happens. I'm witnessing my brother uh, in uh, the living room that day, and I literally see him take his last breath. And that's where the beginning of the tragedy of this whole story starts. And as I said I was earlier, I'm going to show you how God turned my life around. But I had to tell you the real story and tell you the whole truth, as it were, so you can see where I started from. So... That day, I remember losing uh, touch with my emotions, and I remember feeling something snap that day. I remember noticing that uh, emotionally, uh, I disconnected and withdrew. I saw my father, my mother, and other brothers and sisters going through the grieving process, crying, etc. cetera. Um, but I remember something in me just clenching, and I remember I couldn't cry, I couldn't, uh, you know, respond, uh, feeling like a, a very diff a, a very deep sense of hurt and pain, but finding like no way to express that. And that was the beginning of, of some kind of a trauma, PTSD type, um, uh, you know, like emotional detachment disorder uh, that began to happen. And of course, I'm also continuing to deal with the asthma symptoms as well. Now, my parents end up getting prosecuted. My grandmother comes in, takes us uh, back to Lima, Ohio from Indiana. Uh, that prevents my family and other brothers and sisters from getting dispersed uh, through other foster homes. And we end up uh, under the care of my, my grandmother, who was my mother's mother, and my grandfather, whose house we moved into, who's my dad's father. And uh, we end up back in Lima, Ohio. Uh, we end up getting our treatments, uh, our dental, 
our medical, our shots, and get caught up on everything. And I end up going from being in homeschool there in Indiana to going into the public school system. From that point on, uh, my parents were put on probation. Um, because my parents were in a different co uh, 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 county than the other families that, that uh, had children that passed away, uh, my parents were given a religious exemption, but they were taken away. Uh, their custody was taken away. Long story short, after all of that happened, they say up to 300 deaths took place uh, as a result of people refusing medical treatment, uh, but they have documented at least 100, uh, my brother being one of those. And so now I'm dealing with the ramifications of this. I end up living with my grandfather and my, my other uh, seven brothers, six brothers and sisters at that time, and we're now in Lima, Ohio. I go, go on ahead and finish high school there in the public school system. Um, I then end up uh, graduating from high school in 1995 and uh, end up uh, kind of starting to have somewhat of a sense of normal life. Now, through all this process, I end up picking up music at the age of 12. Um, so you kind of have two different timelines there. You have the sickness in my brother and my asthma issues happening. But during that time, I pick up uh, the guitar and I start listening to artists like Susan Ashton, uh, uh, Wayne Kirkpatrick, um, who co-wrote Change the World for Eric Clapton uh, for the Phenomenon movie. Um, and uh, uh, I believe the angel in that movie was named Michael. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy from Greece. What is his name? Um, uh, but he was the, the main character in that movie. Long story short, um, John Travolta. Uh, let me get a drink of water here. I apologize if my story is a bit congested and uh, long, but it's not easy to just pop the story out to you. Um, so... Wayne Kirkpatrick wrote that song, Change the World, for Eric Clapton, starring that from that John Travolta movie. Uh, Dan Huff, uh, I was listening to a lot of the music of these three people um, with an artist named Susan Ashton. Uh, Susan Ashton used to tour with uh, Garth Brooks and sing back up, and then she became her own Christian artist and had like 17 chart-topping Christian songs. But I'm getting influenced by this music. Wanker Patrick, as a songwriter at that time and producer, had very intimate uh, intimate lyrics. Uh, let me see if I can sing one of the songs I... Uh, There's an agony in living There's a comfort in the truth then no one knows my heart better than you. Part of me is reaching, and part of me holds back. But when it comes to you, I yell the doorway you're free to walk into. Cause no one knows my heart better than you. I literally played that just now for the first time. Uh, I thought I would just take a stab at it. That's the song that I uh, grew up hearing on the radio. And uh, you can go on YouTube and actually, you know, later on, look, listen to that song. It's called No One Knows My Heart. Uh, <clears throat> long story short, um, that song began to speak to me, you know, uh, when he talked about part of me is reaching, part of me is holding back. And when it comes to you, I yield the doorway. Uh, you're free to walk into. No one know, knows my heart better than you. Um, I remember hearing that as, as I was suffocating emotionally. One of the things that they found out about my asthma was that uh, it was called stress-induced asthma. So I believe after doing some research when it comes to flight or flight and also uh, adrenal fatigue, uh, I believe that I was living in kind of a, a state of anxiety and kind of a, uh, a state of fight or flight. Um, and I've done some research to find out that basically uh, I was probably suffering an adrenal fatigue and some kind of emotional stre distress from being in that uh, household environment uh, of living in the cult starting even back at like age 10. So long story short, <clears throat> those lyrics began to penetrate uh, the pain and the sorrow that I was experiencing 
when I was a kid, I was the truth teller in my family. Uh, I remember <clears throat> my parents telling me about how when my grandfather and grandparents were smoking, I would come up, you know, Grandpa, Grandma, don't you know you're not supposed to smoke? That's bad for your health. Why are you smoking? It puts smoke all over the house. Like, I was just, you know, and they're like, do you tell this boy to tell us this stuff? You know, and they're like, no, no, we didn't tell him. <laughs> and so I was always the kid that was like, hello, look, everybody, this elephant, you know. And sadly, as I got older, that voice was squashed. And I would, you know, be reading between the lines. I remember when I was 10 years old or so, I would say, when I get big, I ain't living this way. <laughs> and that was my little, you know, fist, you know, uh, going up in rebellion against what I was seeing and experiencing. And so I began to try to mimic the songwriting lyrics I would see in the CD jackets, the sleeves inside the CDs. And I would start trying to write songs and write lyrics. And I had this old true tone guitar I got from a buddy down the street. Um, this particular guitar uh, was a 1960s true tone. Um, and it was kind of like uh, the guitars you'd see in service merchandise magazines for, or, or catalogs, those of you who are young enough to uh, recognize those. Uh, and uh, or the Sears and Roebuck uh, catalogs. So one day, you know, when I'm about 12 years old, we're living in a trailer park, and we live in a four-bedroom double-wide trailer. Our trailer is the first trailer in our trailer park, and I see my buddy Tim about a block and a half away down the street, and I'd see him and his sisters. He had two sisters, and they'd be walking around their trailer, and I'd see them dragging the guitar by the neck, in the grass and I'd see him come around the trailer and then another I see him come around the trailer and I was like oh my god I would play that guitar and so I talked him into selling me that guitar one day in the front yard and my dad's in the house with the windows open and the trailers the windows they open up like a like a, a kind of the a flap style um, rotating glass with a crank and the windows would open up um, long story short he goes and gets the guitar brings it back to my front yard and I tell him hey I'll pay you four bucks for this guitar when I have the opportunity excuse me to uh, get some money and what I would do is I'd go mow grass in our trailer park and it would get they would pay you five bucks because you know the, the lots and trailer parks the grass lots are very small the bad part was I knew that as soon as I did that, I would have an asthma attack after the mowing of the grass. Uh, and I did it a couple of times just to get money sometimes because we were so poor uh, at that time. And my dad is in the living room, hears me making the deal, saying I don't have the cash. He comes in, he says, hey, out, comes outside and says, hey, you know you don't have the money to, 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 to pay for that guitar. You shouldn't be making any kind of deal. And I just remember looking at the ground and dropping my head. And my dad, you know, grab, reaches into his pocket and, you know, holds out a wad of, of cash like this and puts it in my hand. And it was the $4. And I gave it to my buddy Tim. And that began to be my first situation of trying to play a guitar. It had two strings on it. I remember tuning those strings to some semblance of a... Uh, of, uh, instrument, you know, you know, something that sounded sensible, and I began to play that two strings and later got my dad to drive into town and we put new strings on and I started learning to play and getting people to teach me guitar chords. I got to interject this one little part. My dad had a paddle uh, that was probably about this long. It was a two by four, and at the top of the two by four, um, my dad cut out a square on this side and a square on that side, so you had a handle. And before I got my guitar, what I would do is I would take a shoestring and tie it, tie the knot, uh, like a loop of the shoestrings over the top of the paddle and tie it real tight. And I'd take a clothespin and I'd take the clothespin and put it under the string and put it on the edge so that it raised the string up. And the string would be across here, across the top. And I would be plucking that string and playing it for my or get as a guitar and I would I would do that with grits boxes of oatmeal and, and turn them once my mother was done with Crisco, can, Crisco cans and uh, Crisco plastic boxes and I would take pencils and play them like drums 
Um, and that's kind of how I got my start in music. Now, what happened is later on, I continued to write songs and play music, and I got pretty prominent in my hometown of Lyme, Ohio. Uh, ended up on the news, ended up having a pretty successful commercial that's still running with a restaurant called Happy Days. And um, my music career continued to grow, and that, that ability to write songs gave me a way to get those emotions out and begin to give me a healthy outlet um, for <clears throat> the pain that I was suffering inside. Now, this, at this point, I still can't cry. I still have, am very numb emotionally, uh, very withdrawn. Um, I remember people saying, I love you. I remember people hugging me and having no feeling or connection to that moment. Fast forward to my graduating in uh, 1995. In 1997, I talk to my dad and have this long conversation at the age of 22. And I say, Dad, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm not going to follow the cult teachings. I move out of my parents' house. Um, I become kind of the black sheep, uh, as it were, and I make my first trip to Nashville. Uh, I come to Nashville for a music industry uh, party and seminar uh, with a company called Embassy Music. I come down, I play a few songs. They're like very excited and they try to get me to move to Nashville. Uh, I go home after that first, I go, I go to my hotel uh, after that first seminar meeting that day in Nashville in 1997 and I get a ring that morning uh, from the guy that was running the record label that put on the seminar and he says Kay I want to have a meeting with you so him and his assistant had a meeting with me and I brought my notebook and I showed him all the songs I was writing by hand uh, in my uh, you know multiple divider uh, notebook, spiral notebook. And he says to me, wow. He says, Michael, I've never seen anybody so determined. He says, you're going to make it. He says, you're going to make it. He said, I've never seen anything, anybody like you before, which is pretty profound when he's here in Nashville. Uh, they again, try to get me to move to Nashville. Again, me leaving the small town of Lyme, Ohio and Making a move to the big city intimidates me, and I stay in Ohio another 10 years. This time I get um, connected to a church in Ohio, and I began to be uh, a worship leader there at a church uh, in Lyme, Ohio, uh, and I lead worship there for 10 years. I learn how to produce my own music tracks. Uh, by the time I'm there for over 10 years, I'm playing guitar, I'm playing drums, um, I'm learning bass. I'm also learning piano, and I would make my own karaoke tracks of songs I would write, and I would sing them as special music for the Sunday services. Fast forward in 2008, uh, I've now been there uh, 10 years, and I get the 10-year service award for being there at the church, and I also get the Best Musician Award. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. In 2005, um, I started dating a woman at that point and we uh, get married in 2007 and during this period there are quite a few red flags and i am uh, bringing someone in my, into my life who's very toxic very narcissistic and very mean to me um, so during that process i basically enter into a very toxic marriage i told you about the job loss uh, from the car dealership that happened in 2007 so we get married in 2007 in the summer of 2007, three months later, I get downsized out of that job after being newly married. Uh, my ex-wife at that time uh, tells me six weeks after we get married, I should have never, mar never married you. Um, you, sh you are not a man in my eyes, and I will never respect you or honor you or think of you, uh, at, uh, think of the two of us as a team together. And I remember in that particular conversation, getting out of the car uh, and walking like a half hour in the rain after that conversation. Uh, as we had driven to another location, and I was so disheartened by that statement. What growing up in that toxic environment made me have an appetite for toxic relationships, abusive relationships. Um, I had toxic beliefs about what love truly was, what a uh, healthy family and healthy love even looked like. And so as a result, I attracted uh, very toxic people into my dating life. 
Uh, this also affected the kind of jobs I got. I also often got jobs with the bosses and people that were abusive and coworkers that were abusive. And I always seemed to place myself in situations that were abusive. Fast forward to 2009 when I tell you, told you about my brakes blowing uh, when I, the day I came to Nashville. Um, the, that day when I came to Nashville, it was kind of a, a uh, come to Jesus moment. That day, as I mentioned when I moved here, uh, or not, well, prior to moving here, when I drove here and got here and had that lunch that day at the Cool Springs Brewery in Franklin, just south of Nashville, and my brakes blew uh, in the parking lot with my friend in the, in the passenger seat, that made me stay in Nashville, and I couldn't go back to my old life or go back to Ohio. Well, what I didn't get to tell you was when I was at that table in, at lunchtime in Franklin, right before my brakes blew and before we left, I met a pastor that day. And he said, <clears throat> would you like to be a worship leader in our church here in Tennessee in a, t a small town called uh, Smyrna, which is just a little bit short ways outside of t Nashville, about 15 minutes. And I remember telling him, dude, I'm a basket case. I'm going through a divorce. Um, in 2008, I want to mention this. I had failed to mention that I also attempted suicide in 2008. As from 2007 to 2008, then my marriage got progressively worse. And even during the counseling period, I asked the pastors of the church I was leading worship at at the time for clinical counseling. He told us, you don't need clinical counseling. You need to obey the preaching that we're telling you and the sermons we're telling you, and you'll be okay. And at that point, um, I began to have four-day headaches. Uh, and I remember this one particular week, um, I had a uh, bottle of uh, aspirin, over-the-counter aspirin, Walgreens labeled uh, branded aspirin. And in a week, I emptied the bottle because I was taking them like 10, dial, 10, 10 pills a day trying to stave off these headaches. So fast forward back to me uh, having my brakes go out and me meeting this pastor. And he said, he said, remember Moses, Samuel, and David, when I told him, hey, I'm a basket case. He quoted these, named these three Bible characters. In the spring of 2008, I'm sitting there and uh, I'm, I'm driving in my car and I'm sitting there driving. And I remember God saying to me, it was as if he was speaking in my heart, you're like Moses, you're like Samuel, and you're like David. You're like Samuel because you don't know my voice. You're like Moses because you're ostracized uh, and alone and isolated. And um, you're like David because at that time, um, after 10 years of service at this particular church, the minister of music stepped down and I tried to apply for the job and they rejected me from being uh, having the offer of that opportunity. So... Thankfully, I didn't get the job at that church because they mistreated the music minister at that church in, in Lyme, Ohio, and I would have even experienced even worse treatment. Uh, long story short, when I'm sitting there in front of this pastor, he says those three characters, this is February of 09, and he says those three characters right back to me and names each of them and says back to me almost verbatim what I heard in my heart driving in the car that day. And I remember thinking, how did he know this? Where did he get this information from? But he said each of those characters, Moses, David, and Samuel. He said Moses was ostracized and in isolation when the burning bush experience happened. And God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and said, you know, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground, and told Moses his mission that he would deliver Israel from their uh, abusers in the, the kingdom of Pharaoh, uh, you know, as slaves. He told me about this pastor says, you know, Samuel didn't recognize God's voice. And Eli told him, go back. And when you hear the voice again, say, here am I. Well, that registered in my heart. Um, and I realized that was a prayer that I needed to start praying, just listening to that pastor in that moment. And then he said, David, he said, David was rejected by Saul and by the kingdom around him, even though he was anointed by Samuel and Samuel had proclaimed him king, but Saul thought he was a threat as Saul was still the, the, the current king and David was soon to be king, though he was a young man or teenager at the time when Samuel came and poured the oil on his head and anointed him to be king. So I remember this conversation happening in Franklin at this restaurant and I excused myself and go to the restroom. 
And I'm standing there in a the restroom and my heart's beating so hard, it's making me rock back and forth like this. And I remember thinking, my goodness, um, that was really intense that I would have one of those God moments, uh, miraculous moments, where in my heart I knew that things were getting, to, getting ready to radically change. And I just kept feeling this voice, stay in Nashville. Like it was just reverberating through me. Stay in Nashville, stay in Nashville, stay in Nashville. So I go back out, sit down at the table again, trying to gather myself. And the pastor says, well, will you lead worship for us this Sunday? This is on a Thursday. I had gotten the shifts from Thursday up to Saturday covered. And I knew I had to be back at work on Saturday. Well, I told you what happened. We leave the restaurant, get in the car, and the brakes blow out. Long story short, I can't leave Nashville. Um, and now I'm stuck in Nashville. And, you know, it's a $1,000 minimum repair bill to get my car running again. My buddy Leroy, who's in the car that was laughing at the brakes being blown, we have to drive 45 minutes from, from Franklin back to a suburb of Nashville called Antioch. So we're driving, you know, like, you know, oh my goodness, okay, okay, we're coming up, we're coming up to the stoplight, okay, right about now. <laughs> and, you know, in, in, in uh, Toyotas, uh, the Japanese vehicles, the emergency brake is in the center. So we <laughs> drove 45 minutes back to Antioch that way. Uh, and that began my journey in Nashville. Well, as I began to live in Nashville, the church job never worked, never really worked out. But I came to a church here um, called Father's House at that time, and I met a pastor named Craig Wall. Craig Wall uh, had a conversation with me at this church uh, here in Franklin, and he says, you know, here's my story, here's where I've been, what I've been going through, the tragedies I'm experiencing. I'm in the middle of a, the beginning of a divorce, and he says, Michael, you need clinical counseling. And so the first time someone actually listens to me and gets me in clinical counseling, uh, I go to the refuge centers in Franklin's, and for like six to nine months, I go to counseling, and they start walking me through these toxic love definitions, um, the low self-esteem, the self-loathing, the self-hate, <clears throat> uh, the way that I'm talking to myself internally, where I'm demeaning and speaking down and talking down to myself. And through the message, messages that were pe preached by Pastor Craig Wall and even him doing some counseling with me, I started to realize that God was trying to change my life. And then during that period, um, I began to pray that statement that was prayed, that was told to me by that pastor, here am I. And then I began to go to these small group settings, small group Bible studies uh, at Father's House Church. And so the whole church was probably about 200 members, and they were meeting in a small uh, storefront. But when we would break up into small groups at people's homes, we'd have these small group Bible studies. And they began to put their hand on me and pray over me um, and encourage me. And just all of a sudden, I went from this mega church kind of environment to this family-like atmosphere. And they one of the small groups, they began to uh, read Proverbs, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to unto your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And I remember that text, acknowledge him in all your ways. So I started praying, uh, Lord, uh, here am I and I acknowledge you in all my ways. And then I would uh, begin to pray that over myself. Now, during this time, when I'm going to this church in Franklin, I have a friend named Rico. The day that my brakes blew out, he was one of the people at that table beside Leroy, besides the pastor, and uh, Rico was there and myself. So there was four of us at that table that day. Rico gave me a place to stay that day here in Nashville, Franklin area. And uh, I ended up living with him rent-free for a year as I got on my feet. And uh, I would go, I had this bedroom that he let me crash in, and uh, I would just sit there and cry for hours every day, every day, every, every night uh, for months. Uh, I go to, go to work. By this point, I'm now in Nashville, and I get uh, Franklin, and then I get a job at this Ashley Furniture store selling furniture. So I, um, you know, I told you that my brakes were, had run out, had blown out. So I'm walking a half hour to work every day. I'm going to, to Father's House Church. 
I'm, <clears throat> I'm, uh, 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 you know, attending the church there, going to counseling sessions. This is now my new life, going to these small and small prayer groups. And I just remember this, uh, upheaval of new life and just new sense of like something is tingling and beginning to move in my heart and in my spirit. Uh, and I could tell that God was changing my life. Um, one of the one of the biggest things that I had to learn coming to Nashville was how to ask for help, how to say I'm overwhelmed, how to say it's too much, uh, these emotional feelings and uh, the toxic marriage, the toxic church experience, the toxic church experience from my father and the family experience that I had there had all kind of come to my head and had destroyed my life. And so at this point, I'm now beginning to change my life and beginning to move forward. Um, and I'm beginning to get healthy input into my life to begin to change, <clears throat> excuse me, I begin to change <clears throat> my life situation. Excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, long story short, sorry for the sneezing there. Um, uh, so my journey to, to getting healthy has started. And so now I'm starting to realize that I probably should have moved to Nashville back in 97 when that uh, record label, <laughs> excuse me, executive asked me to consider moving to Nashville. Um, and I saw myself for the first time starting to do more than just be a follower. And I felt that I was beginning to hear God's voice. <laughs> Excuse me. I don't know why the sneezing all of a sudden. Um, all that to say, I started having a sense that my life had been clogged up and had been um, not what it should have been. And, and I was like, you know, racing to catch up. Um, all that to say, this began a journey of me really beginning to pray and hear God for the first time. Um, I'm going through this grief process where I'm, you know, crying in my room every night just because I'm feeling my whole life has disintegrated. Um, but at the same time, I feel God taking my life back into a new place. Um, and I began to hear this journey. I remember hearing this song from a friend uh, of Rico's uh, where the guy I was staying with, uh, they played this video uh, by Jesus Culture. He loves us Oh, how he loves us. And I would sit in my room after hearing him play that at his house one day. I would sit in my room and watch that video on my computer, and I would just say, Lord, I don't know anything. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what my life is going to be. But I'm in this distress. My life is broken. But I believe that those words in that song are true. And I would just cry and say, okay, God, I believe that you love me. And I would just kind of listen to that song for some sense of comfort and relief and I kept finding more and more that I began to believe that God loved me and that he had a purpose for my life and that he was going to redeem my life and turn it around um, <clears throat> fast forward to 2012 I meet another young woman uh, at a small group we hastily get married after three months of dating six weeks later she walks out of my life and abandons me. Um, and I remember connecting with this psychologist um, who had become a mentor to me at that time. And he said to me, Michael, he says, you're not right. He says, you've gone through this annulment because the marriage hadn't been long enough. So now I've, I've destroyed two marriages and invited two very toxic people into my life. And he says, we need to get you into Sozo prayer. And he took me to an office and he made a case file uh, a, manim, a manila envelope with, and he says, we're going to do, we're going to walk through every major trauma of your life. And he's obviously a psychologist and doing, you know, not only the clinical process, but also was a believer. And so he walks me through every trauma. And every time we would come to a trauma, he would say, I want you to visualize, visualize that trauma. And I'd close my eyes. And he'd say, now I want you to visualize Jesus coming in and putting his arm around you and walking with you through that trauma. And then he says, we're going to ask you, I'm going to ask you questions based upon that trauma. What do you believe about yourself? 
and I would tell them, well, you know, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. I don't feel like I'm worthy. I don't feel like God would love me. And we would walk through that, and he'd say, we're going to renounce the uh, toxic beliefs that you believed over yourself from that pain. And then we would go to the next one, the next one, the next one. After about two hours of that, uh, we close the prayer. He has this file for my, you know, situation. He closes that up, and he says, okay. He says, it's a new day for you. And I remember walking out of that studio office, and I remember feeling light and finally feeling uh, the pain of my brother's death uh, had finally lifted, and I wasn't carrying that grief anymore. Uh, and I began to be able to cry again. Uh, I began to be able to laugh, and people would hug me and embrace me, or they say, I love you, and I began to feel again. Um, <clears throat> fast forward to 2016, I've been talking to a few different friends, and they say, Michael, you need to put your story in a book. You need to write your story. Your story is a movie. I remember getting connected with um, a guy named Howie Klausner, who wrote the movie Space Cowboys, and the movie... Uh, uh, wrote, wrote and produced the movie with Clint Eastwood, and we ended up having a meeting right when I started the manuscript of this book. This book is called From Cult to Country, An Asthmatic's Journey to Find More Air, and it tells my, my redemption story. And I began to write my story from birth to the present at that time, which was 2017, by the time I got the entire manuscript written. And I talked about my redemption journey. I talked about how God changed my self-esteem from self-loathing and self-hating. Um, I talked about how the signs that I began to recognize that I was in a cult and I needed to get out. I talked about the, the how-tos that I began to see from the tragedies and the things that I went through. Um, I began to see the how-tos that I learned and the some things that I survived and the things that made me resilient um, through all of that. And I began to put that in this book. And what that began to do was give me a healing process and begin to change the pain that I was experiencing to a mission forward for me to help and reach other people. And it began to give me a pathway where I could see out of my pain and see the end of my pain and then see a new start where I would have a journey forward beyond my pain uh, where I wouldn't relive it and uh, suffer or be triggered and go through the, the devastation process again every time I would tell my story. There was a period over that 10-year period where I would tell my story and I would get a massive headache uh, just trying to tell, tell my story. But I started being brave and realizing the power of telling my story. As I began to tell my story uh, in 2016, what would happen is people would walk up to me and they would say, after I would tell, them, tell my story, they would say, you're the only person that's ever... <clears throat> talk to me this way. Um, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have felt confidence to tell you my story. And having heard your story, I know that I'm not alone anymore. And so I realized every time I would talk to people, they would say, say those three things. And often what would result is they would tell me their whole story or the, or the most tragic portions of the story. As a re result of me telling this story, I've heard some of the most tragic, awful stories you could ever imagine. But as a result is I started noticing that telling a story gives people the freedom to speak up on their own behalf um, because many of them were experiencing abuse or trauma and they hadn't given voice to it and they were, you know, holding it and suffering with it and suffering in silence. And so as I began to tell my story, people would say, you're the first person I've ever told my story to. If you hadn't spoken up, I wouldn't have been a, uh, confident that I, to tell my story. And so I began to realize that God was calling me to a mission of taking my music and putting the stories together, taking my book and putting the stories together, and giving that as a new mission for my life, that I wasn't just going to be a country music artist or country music star, but that I would actually take these uh, tools that God has given me and actually be a mission of help and love to people. And so in 2017, after I got my book fix, finished, the bottom end of 2018, uh, we start the marketing campaign and I meet this guy named Tom Jackson. Tom Jackson introduces me to a missions organization. The missions organization is called MAP International or Medical Assistance Program. Uh, they used to do international medical relief campaigns with Billy Graham. Um, 
And um, long story short, uh, we began to work together and put my music and story together and connect it to this missions organization, which is a Forbes top charity, and they serve uh, 19 to 30 million people every year. They do disaster medical relief uh, in the big, you know, a Puerto Rico disaster that happened a couple years ago, the big flood in Texas, the 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 uh, the, the coronavirus uh, situation. They were assisting the medical facilities and walk-in clinics um, with medical supplies and resources. So every time I do music, um, people have an opportunity to go visit my donation page and actually. Um, contribute to the cause of medication. So because my story was a story of medical neglect, I now have the ability to send medication to other people. God has taken my story of tragedy and turned it around and made it a mission and a help to people who would otherwise not have medication. Um, my book, From Cult to Country, you can go to my website, michaelricksrix.com, and order the book there. It's $20 and um, I can do signed copies for you, or you can go on Amazon and just purchase it. Uh, but it's called From Cult to Country, an Asthmatic Journey to Find More Air. Uh, you can also donate to my charity, which is map.org forward slash Michael Ricks, um, R-I-X, I mean R-I-C-K-S. My branding, we're doing some things differently with my branding. The X represents medication. For example, uh, that's what it represents in my logo and all that. Um, I'm going to play a few more songs for you. Um, my website is michaelrix.com. Um, and my uh, donation page on MAP International is map.org forward slash michaelrics. And I've been in the studio with um, the guy to sing the last time with Charlie Pride <clears throat> before he passed away. His name is Jimmy Allen. Jimmy Allen has a producer named Eric Torres, and Eric Torres has produced my song called Don't Let It Get the Best of You. Thanks for posting those websites. I see that on the chat here. We've all been down, down for the count. We've all been done wrong sometime. We've all got days that we like to erase, but you can't turn back. Lost time Don't let it Don't let it Get the best of you Don't let it Don't let it Get the best of you Don't let it Don't let it Get the best of you mm -hmm. Don't let it Don't let it Get the best of you Every day is a chance to 
crew look up from their crowd Rise above the ground Take flight Every day is a chance To look up from the crowd Rise above the ground And take flight Oh I appreciate so much that you all have uh, taken the time to stay with me. Um, I hope my story wasn't too heavy for you, and I hope that um, you're able to kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. <clears throat> the biggest thing is, through all this journey, as these songs are a representation, the biggest thing that God has done in my life is changed the way I talk to myself internally. And uh, the attraction to the uh, toxic people <laughs> Uh, and the toxic dating relationships that used to come into my life has stopped. And um, I'm now bringing healthy people into my life. And um, I'm not living in the cyclical pattern of defeat, as my old pastor used to say. Uh, and I'm seeing a new life in my life. Um, I'm 
I'm gonna do this song and then one more. And I'm gonna hang out here in the Zoom for you who may have questions or just wanna talk and uh, I'm here for you. This song is called Late Bloomer. I've been hurt too hard to love easy. Don't try to please me, just to rush me so fast. When my broken heart is still bleeding, what I am needing is a slow love that lasts. I need a little time I'm just a late bloomer I'm gonna open my heart up to you Wish that it came sooner But you can't control what love will do I'm worth the wait I'm worth the appreciate everybody that's stayed with me and uh one of the things that you may have noticed these Christ these songs uh, have like a faith theme but they're not necessarily jesus god praise lord as maybe a worship song or a christian song and many of these songs i'm getting to sing in arenas that would ne not necessarily be christian arenas uh, but as you can see i have a background in worship music and so as a result um, I'm singing songs about faith and uh, songs about Jesus uh, that is, in a, is a way that people that may not be churched or have a background in uh, Christianity or may have even strayed uh, can connect to. And so I ended up telling this same story, uh, a much shorter version where I don't have to, uh, uh, you know, where I don't have a situation where I may be able to, to tell that kind of story like in a concert. And I'm still able to share my story and my book and my cause with my charity and still tell the Christ redemption story and get people to listen to music about Jesus who would may not otherwise show up in a church or uh, even feel like the church would still be standing after they entered the church. Um, this will be my last song. Savior sang by strength indeed is small tired of a weakness watch and pray find in me your all 
been long Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Now I find thy power in thine alone can change the leopard spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all to him my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. Praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one. And raise his life up from the dead. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Well, thank you all so much. Um, please reach out on Facebook and TikTok, Instagram, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, say hello. Um, you can go to TikTok and just type in I am Michael R-I-X. Um, I am Michael R-I-X in Instagram or Facebook. Uh, my Facebook friend page is full, but my fan page uh, can accept, you know, more people. And uh, I'm so thankful for you all to be here. Um, so I'll let the folks that uh, helped coordinate this, Beth and Ben, uh, help me kind of figure out how to process through the last bit here. Um, I'm here uh, for your questions or hanging out in general. Ben? So I have this mic here. Can you hear me on this mic? We sure can. So um, maybe we could have folks that are here if they have any questions uh, in the church for Michael. First off, anybody? And as, as people feel comfortable uh, in our old WIC audience over here, if you'd like to turn on your cameras and uh, unmute, you're welcome to do that uh, and wave hello. We'd love to see you, but, you know, just as you feel comfortable. So first of all, um, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Incredible story and incredible music. Thanks so much. We're, we are quite a bit you know, a little bit beyond the time where we thought we would be so if you if you need to scoot you can just do that but if you'd like to stay and ask any questions i'm happy to hand the mic to anybody thank you michael for your testimony and the, uh, good music today um could you uh lead us in a song of jesus loves me you know that on the, on the uh, what was what was the name of the song? I'm sorry. 
Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, I think it said. Ah, yes, absolutely. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Yes, Jesus loves me. Thank you, Michael. Oh, you're so welcome. Anyone else? Thank you so much, Michael. We hope you have a uh, blessed next season in your as you get through your recording session uh, sessions uh, with Eric and get some great music recorded. And we look forward to seeing what comes next for you. And we'll be praying for you. And hope you'll pray for us as we move into what we're doing and, and ask God's blessings all around. So let's give one more round of applause to Michael. Well, God bless you and thank you all so much. Um, and uh, we'll see you again next time. And uh, I appreciate um, just the opportunity to share and connect with you all. God bless you. Pastor is going to say a prayer. I want to just say a prayer, Michael, for you. And uh, um, as we go, just ask God's blessing on each of us. Gracious God, we pray for your continuing anointing of Michael to tell his story. Difficult story to tell, difficult story to hear. Yet, Lord, we know that you are a power in the midst of difficult stories and difficult lives. You have the power to bring us from death to life. And we give you thanks for leading Michael and for using his life uh, for your glory. Continue to bless him, to bless others, and continue to bless the church that he blesses even in the even in the world outside of the walls of a, ch- a church building, Lord, who continues to praise your name and to help guide people to you. So let your uh, church be well. Uh, lead your church to health and vitality and let it praise your holy name and, and lift up your name above every name. So we give this to you, Lord, and ask you to continue to lead us and guide us that we may serve you with our whole lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Blessings to you. Thank you again. Thanks all for joining us. Well, God bless you and thank you all once again.